brothers and sisters, the Lord is with you. And also with you. We continue listening to God speak to us from the gospel in the tradition of Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Some Sadducees who denied that there was a resurrection came forward. And Jesus said to them, The children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain to the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like angels, and they are the children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is not God of the dead, but of the living, for to God all are alive. This is the gospel, the good news of our salvation. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. By the words of the gospel, may our sins be blotted out. Amen. Good evening. Good evening, Father. Um, the gospel this evening is a truncation of a longer text, which we decided that, because it gets convoluted, but there is one section here um, that might give more clarification to what was read tonight. Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. That was in the Torah. And basically what it was saying is that if a man gets married, has no children, then it was the duty of the, of the, of the brother of the individual, if he not married, to take up a, take the wife and, and marry her and uh, uh, procreate uh, so that his brother might have descendants after him. Now, <clears throat> there's a, a fine line between the, the logistics of this in the sense of being a legal thing and also a spiritual thing. Because it was in the Jewish mind that to die without descendants was uh, a lack of immortality. There was no one there to remember your name. And as I mentioned to uh, you before, the greatest curse you could level against another person was, may there be no one to remember your name. In other words, you're annihilated. Nobody remembers you. You have no memory on this earth. And so <clears throat> the Sadducees, as, as uh, Father told us, they don't believe in the resurrection. They were a sect of, of very high-born uh, individuals, well-educated, well-healed. Well um, and they, their, their practice, their, their priesthood, basically was attached to the temple. And that's why when the temple f fell in 70 AD, the, the role of the Sadducee, the high priest, was null and void because there was no place to offer sacrifice. On the other hand, the Pharisees were more of those individuals who were out in the field. They were the ones who ran the synagogues and the villages uh, uh, away from the temple that uh, people would be able to attend without having to go to temple sacrifice or temple services uh, in Jerusalem. And so we're faced with this reality of marriage <clears throat> and who's, who's uh, responsible now? Uh, whose wife is it going to be? Because in the longer version, it says they had seven brothers. Seven brothers. And this poor woman had to deal with seven brothers not having any children. Finally, she died. But thank God. She probably prayed for death. <laughs> and hoped that he didn't have any other brothers in the wood pile. <laughs> so... Here we have this poor woman, she dies after having to marry seven men, and then they're wondering, well, whose husband is, uh, whose wife is she going to be? Well, here again, the legality. Why, why is it so important that she be 
whose husband is she, or whose wife is she. And that was because of the fact that marriage was nothing more than a legal bond to have sex. It was a legal uh, okay to have sex with a, with a woman primarily and only for the procreation of children. And we see this carried over into the Christian era as well. St. Paul tells us in his earlier writings that we should live like angels, not having any, any physical attractions to the world, detached from the world, and having no, no inner feelings of, of sexuality or anything like that. He said, but if you have to, if you can't restrain yourself, all right, get married. Marriage was the way to, to answer the question about this concupiscence of sexuality within the structure, and it made it legal. But the point of marriage was not the love between husband and wife. The point of marriage was to procreate, and especially sons, so that someone would remember the husband's name. So the wife basically was nothing more than a medium to which the husband's immortality was granted. And this happens, uh, this, this problem uh, arises and happens when we take religion and make it a legally binding um, law that takes place over the whole idea of spirituality. The whole idea of spirituality and that is a problem with our church it has been for 2,000 years that which is spoken in mere human consequences is now divine law it's divine law and we see that throughout our ages we're old enough to remember post uh, pre-vatican II, where everything was a sin if you ate a hot dog on Friday you're going to hell Regardless of whether you killed anybody or stole anybody or raped anybody, you're going to help eat a hot dog on Friday because why? No one was hungry. There was nothing else to eat. But you're going to hell. And how many people after that it changed were in hell saying, ah, I should have waited for that hot dog? <laughs> but see, we get into a sense of right and wrongness about our religion, a right and wrongness. And that basically was the way in which we as a church govern the people. It was not out of spirituality or love of God or anything else, it was out of fear. If you don't do, if you do, you're gonna go to hell for all eternity. There you will suffer greatly, greater than anything you can imagine here on earth. Well, yeah, okay, I'll do what you say, because I, I really don't want to go to hell. But, uh, all right, I'll do what you say, because uh, the, the alternative is not very uh, hopeful. And so many of us lived a life of fear following the law, and the law became so exact that we, we would never veer right from left, left to right, from the law, from the dictate of whatever it was, to the point of if that, if that, that egg that we were going to eat on Friday happened to pass uh, an Arby's restaurant and because of the meat, uh, it might be contaminated, and, and therefore that we would be eating meat on Friday. I mean, that's the extent to which we go. And we find that, the, that some Jewish sects are like that. That the law of kosher is so strict that uh, there's, there has to be a, a, a dividing line, you can't put it here, you can't put it, but any, be that as it may, what we do is we take those laws and we make them divine. And in the process, we lose the sense of spirituality. We lose the sense of relationship 
because God with us our, is a relationship. It's a relationship. When you are told by a master to do something, that is not a relationship. You are told what to do and you do it. Why? Because of fear of being punished. If someone came to you and said, if your partner, your lover, whoever it is, came to you and said, do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Why? Because you've got a gun to my head. <laughs> and yeah, I'm going to say I love you. Because you've got a gun to my head. And so when we look at these, these um, laws and these traditions, we need to take them down off the pedestal. They are not the reason for the church. The reason of the church is not to follow law. Do we have laws and regulations? Sure, every, every organization does. But the point why we're here tonight is not to fulfill an obligation because I'm afraid of going to hell and so I go to church on Sunday or Saturday night to fulfill my obligation. It has nothing to do with a relationship with God. It has nothing to do with communication with Jesus and receiving body and blood. <coughs> to fulfill my obligation. So I take my hour, I fulfill my obligation, I go to the dentist once a year and I go back to my life living it as I've never encountered Jesus in the sacrament at all. And so this hour has nothing more to do with me than an obligation. <coughs> and that's the way our mentality is. Sometimes what we do here has absolutely no effect on the way we are going to be when we walk out that door. We're going back to the same old, same old. We had a nice cup of coffee, we had a piece of cheesecake, and we're happy and we're going home to the same old, same old. And is that why we're here? To fulfill an obligation. Well, the obligation should not come out of whether you're going to hell or not, but out of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? Peter said, you know I love you. And three times he asked him that, because three times Peter denied him. And as we read in John's Gospel, Peter was upset and heartbroken because for the third time he said, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Well, that's the question that Jesus is asking us. Do you love me? Do you love me because of this obligation that you have to fulfill? Or do you love me because I love you? And the response to love is love, not obligation. Is there obligation when we come to that point of loving one another? Absolutely. And that obligation is to make sure that that love grows every single day stronger and stronger until we cannot breathe without the other. So tonight, as we listen to these words, let us not take to heart the legality which sometimes clouds who and what we are in relationship to God. We are precious in His sight. His Son died for us. And we have nothing to fear.